just going to pray before I go into uh, what the Lord's put on my heart to share today. Father, I thank you for what you're doing at this time. I thank you that your spirit is moving. I thank you that you're awakening hearts across the world. And Father, we, we come into agreement with heaven right now. We break agreement with every deception. We break agreement with every fear. We break agreement with everything that will seek to shut us down. And we say, Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in and through us. Lord, as I bring your word, I ask for utterance, I ask for clarity, I ask for revelation. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to receive what the Spirit is saying at this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. When a nation is in its greatest hour of darkness, God often raises up his greatest prophets. Just look through history and look through scriptures. Elijah came out of nowhere. We don't know where Elijah has been. He just, he just exploded out of nowhere, 1 Kings 17. We don't know his history. We don't know how he grew up. We don't know what he was doing all those years. But when he showed up, he showed up ready for the moment. He showed up because God had been preparing him for that moment. And you've got to realize what's going on right now in the nation with the coronavirus. God is not surprised by it. God is not in heaven thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do about this? God is not scared. And God is looking for the people that have been prepared for such a time as this. And you know who those people are? You. <laughs> you may not realize it, but when a nation is in its greatest darkness and hour of oppression and fear, God is raising up his prophetic voice. I know BBC has something to say. I know Sky News has something. I know all the news channels have something to say. But have you considered what heaven has to say? Because there are headlines for the United Kingdom that heaven has right now. How about we check into heaven's headlines? <laughs> Lord, what are you saying? Maybe we need to switch off the news. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to listen, but sometimes too much of that can cause us to be seeing things from this perspective as opposed, for, as opposed to from heaven's perspective. So when God wants to raise up his prophets... They cannot be people that are going to be bound by fear. Because Elijah was full of fire and boldness. Because he'd been in the secret place. He'd been prepared for that hour. So when he got up and he said to the king, there shall be no rain all these years except at my word. He said, before the Lord God of Israel whom I stand, there shall be no rain. Except at my, he didn't even say except at God's words. Except by my words. That's a person that understands the authority that they carry. Are you hearing me today? That's a person that understands the authority of their words. And Elijah was a man who carried great authority. Not just that word. Elijah was a man of intercession. And I believe more than any other time. God is wanting to raise up his church to be a prophetic voice to the nation right now and to the nations. So somebody say, I will not be silent. And I want you to say, I say, I will not be silent. And let's say to the church, we will not be silent. Yeah. And we're not going to partner with fear either. We're going to partner with hope and faith. Now we're going to walk in wisdom and wash our hands and do all the things we need to do in the natural, but we will not come under that spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in the book of Numbers, uh, you read an interesting uh, story. Numbers 16, uh, from verse 46, probably from verse uh, 41, the whole chapter really. Uh, I want to encourage you to read the Bible. There's some crazy stories in there <laughs> that just blow your mind. And this is one of them. Some people rebelled against Moses. Uh, and Aaron, and the judgment of God came down. And do you know what happened? <laughs> the ground opened up, <laughs> swallowed them, and closed back up again. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like I haven't, but that is pretty intense. <laughs> and, you know, we talk about Elijah. Elijah got angry. Well, he got upset at some people that were coming to probably arrest him. And he prayed, and fire fell from heaven and consumed them. Listen, there's some crazy stories in this book. You better read it. <laughs> because you've got to understand the type of God we serve. 
Some people say, oh yeah, God was mad in the Old Testament and happy in the New Testament. Uh, my question to those people is, have you read the book of Revelations? <laughs> because as one great theologian says, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So it's not one or the other, it's both. And the dimensions of God hidden in these stories. And as the Holy Spirit gives us revelation, we're able to unlock what he's saying to us in our time and in our day. So here you have the judgment of God coming on a people who are opposing God. And then after that judgment, the people start to complain against Moses and Aaron. So... The first judgment against the first group of people were those who were opposing Moses and Aaron. Now, once those people had been eliminated, the whole community started to complain against the leaders that they had killed these people, even though, uh, you know, Moses didn't do anything. Are you hearing me? So now God is releasing judgment against the people of God. And so we come to verse 46. So Moses, uh, so this is Numbers 16, verse 46. So Moses said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire in it from the altar put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them for wrath has gone out from the Lord and the plague has begun then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly and already the plague had begun among the people so he put in the incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the living And the dead, or it says between the dead and the living, and so the plague stopped. Amen. I'm going to stop there. And uh, as I'm just thinking about the kind of time we're in right now, I couldn't help but just reflect on this story of what was going on. Because a plague is sweeping across the nation. Now, uh, the, the plague on the people of God came as a result of judgment. I don't believe this thing going on right now is of God. Just like Pastor Steve said, I believe it's of the enemy because of the fruits and what it's producing in people and what I can see across the culture. I don't believe it's of the Lord. But I want to liken what's going on right now to what I see uh, going on in that passage we just read where there is a plague sweeping across the whole community and people are dying and pretty much there's a virus going on and there's something going on where God raises up an individual And his responsibility was to stand between the living and the dead and stop the plague. Church, that's us. Did you hear me? That's not for the lady at the back of the church that likes to pray. And we just send all our prayer requests to do all our praying for us. That is for us. We at this time are called to be those who stand between the living and the dead with the incense. Do you know what the incense represents? Worship and prayer. Now, what does the coronavirus attack? Your lungs. It's trying to affect your breath. It's trying to affect your sound. Are you hearing me? When your sound is absolutely key in this hour, the body of Christ, listen, our sound is so key. One of the words the Lord gave us as we came into 2020 is the fact that 2020 is the Gregorian calendar. And people talk about, you know, uh, 2020 vision and all that stuff. However, in the Hebrew calendar is the year 5780. And the, 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 the Hebraic letter representing this decade is P E H, I believe it is. Is it P E H or P E Y? Now, that word represents sound, represents mouth, represents releasing something. Are you hearing me? So the decade is about sound, is about your mouth, and guess what's happening right now? Something attacking the breath. To stop the sound from coming forth. So when you're shut down in fear. See, you don't even have to be infected with the virus. You could be infected with fear. And when you're infected, in fact, it seems like the virus of fear right now is moving greater in in speed and in impact than the actual virus itself that people are talking about. More people are infected with fear right now. So they come to us and say, they want to praise God, but the sound they're releasing is contaminated sound because it's been infected by the fear virus. 
And how can you set people free from the things you yourself are bound to? When the church is called to stand between the living and the dead and release incense, but the church itself is now infected, God help us. So we need to be allowing the Holy Spirit to come and uh, uh, bring a, a detox of our mind, our souls, our emotions. And even as Pastor Steve was leading us this morning, let faith begin to arise. And let the sound not be shut down. That's why I led you in a declaration that you said, and we're going to say it again, I will not be silent. So don't say that. It's a time to release your sound. It's a time to release not just any sound, but a sound that's rooted in faith. A sound that's rooted in who God is. A sound that's not under the domination of the media and intimidation and all the fear and all the stuff going on. A pure sound from heaven. When they went around that wall of Jericho and they were silent and then God told them to release the sound, that was not a natural sound. Now, it was a natural sound in that it came from their mouth, but there was supernatural power behind the sound because of the obedience Because they've been following the instructions of God. So when they released that sound, something from heaven was released that actually caused the natural things in front of them to just shake and break and be removed. Because of where the sound was coming from. Where is your worship coming from? Where is your prayer coming from? Because God is wanting you to be an intercessor in this hour. Standing between. That's the job of the intercessor. The ultimate picture of intercession is the cross. The ultimate intercessor is Jesus. He stood between the living God and dead humanity. And by one act of intercession, he killed the virus of sin. And he made a way for us to access the righteousness of God. And now we're called to be like Jesus on the earth, to be those who reconcile who stand between the living and the dead and are able to release a cry to heaven for society, for the lost. Be the evangelist. Be the light of God where we are. Reconciling God to man, man to God. Calling people back into a relationship with him. And this is the time when the enemy wants to shut down our sound. Now, the incense they released that said is worship and intercession. And I want to break this myth. That intercession is a gift for some special people in the body of Christ. You know, the woman at the back of the church or, you know, the old lady that is always faithful in all the prayer meetings. And we all know she likes to pray. So when we're in trouble, we just send her all our prayer requests. Listen, you cannot outsource your prayer life. Jesus himself is an intercessor. The Holy Spirit is an intercessor. Don't you tell me intercession is for someone that doesn't have anything else to do. When God himself does it, (laughs) that shows you the weightiness in the heart of God. That shows you where the, the place God has put intercession. It's such a huge deal to God. He himself does it. So, I mean, it's a big thing when we begin to agree with him in intercession. Look through scripture. The greatest prophets, the men and women of God, they were all intercessors. You know, uh, Joseph and the team were leading us in worship a few moments ago, and powerful, anointed. You didn't, you didn't watch them and go, hey, Joseph, can you do my worship for me? Now, he, he's a worshiper first and foremost, but added to that is leadership. And in that leadership, his ability to play and sing. And so when he does what he does, it enables all, us all to be able to focus on God and worship. You cannot worship and worry at the same time. I don't know if you've tried it. (laughs) It's either one or the other. Because when you worship, you take the focus off you. And now you're focusing on him. You see, that's where the breakthrough happens. When you're focusing on him, not just on you all the time. So when he's leading us in worship, he's a leader in that sphere of worship. He doesn't do our worship for us. He leads us and enables us to be more effective in all of us together worshiping God. So this is not the worship team. We are the worship team. In the same way in intercession, there's some people that are called to lead in that area. They might have a ministry called prayer stomp. 
or they might have another ministry where they do a lot of things and mobilize and pray. But that's not to say it's just for them and not for everyone else. So everyone say, I am an intercessor. You are called to be a voice of intercession and prayer. I like to put it this way. You're called to be a VIP, a voice of intercession and prayer. And you've got to be a voice in the heavens. So just like Aaron stood between the living and the dead, I believe God is speaking to us right now to be a people that are going to stand at this time and release incense to heaven to stop the plague. It has to stop. Someone said it has to stop. Because this has gone all over the world and we're saying enough is enough. Someone say enough is enough. <laughs> it has to stop. Now I want you to turn to Matthew 14. One of the problems we have when we come to the place of prayer is uh, perspective. And I'm going to just uh, make reference to a few things Jesus did here that I believe is a picture of how he wants us to uh, approach intercession and prayer when we come before the throne of God. Uh, Matthew, 7, I'm sorry, Matthew 14, uh, 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. See, as I'm reading that right now, the word alone has a totally different impact now than it did a few months ago. <laughs> I'm just thinking, oh, he was alone there. Now, I know there's all this stuff going on about isolation. Now, I'm an introvert. So I was talking to my wife and we're like, oh, my goodness, seven days of isolation. That's heaven to me. <laughs> but for the extrovert, that's like hell. For me, I'm like, oh, I can do so much. I can read. I can write. I can, oh, my goodness, I, all the business. I'm, I can pray. I can go. But I can understand that that is like hell for some people. But listen, if you want to go deep in God, you need to learn how to have some alone time with him, which is what Jesus was able to do. Now, um, the start of this verse, I guess the context here is um, Jesus receives uh, news that his, uh, his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. And so Jesus is wanting to go away and have some time. Now, Jesus was just like us in that he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He got tired. He slept. He ate. So he must have felt something hearing the news that his cousin had been beheaded. And I'm sure he probably just needed some space to reflect, maybe to grieve. I don't know. But he needed some space. Now he's trying to get away from the multitudes. And he's trying to get away. And they see him. And so they kind of run around uh, to where he's going. And he gets there. And there's multitudes of people, and he's moved with compassion, and he starts to minister to them. And this is where you have the feeling of the 5,000, and all these great miracles happened. Now, after all of that, that must have taken a lot of hours from traveling to one side, from, one, from traveling from one side of the sea to the other side, and then feeding the 5,000, and then now it's getting late at night, and then he sends the multitudes away, and then he does something very strange. He chooses to climb up a mountain. Now, you got to just put yourself in Jesus' shoes. One, he's probably physically exhausted from a busy day. Having preached, having traveled, having had bad news. Are you hearing me? <laughs> he's not just physically exhausted. He's probably emotionally exhausted. Physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted. Do you know what Jesus does? He turns on Netflix to watch a box set. No, that's not what he does. But that's what many of us do. <laughs> or turn on the TV and just listen to news all day. That's not what he does. Physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, he chooses to climb up a mountain. Which is actually quite exhausting. Now, I don't think I've really climbed up a mountain. But I had to climb up a flight of stairs this morning. And I said to myself, this is a bit of exercise. <laughs> Now, that must have been physically exhausting for Jesus to do that. But the, what I actually want to draw your attention to is, he, one of the first things he did was after feeding the multitudes, immediately Jesus made disciples get in the boat. 
uh, to get to those that while he sent the multitudes away. So he has been with people all day, people all around him. Now he's like, okay, I need to just get along with God. He chooses to send the multitudes away. And then his mindset is, I need to get along with God. Now this challenges me because Jesus' prayer life was more important to him than food or sleep. So now he chooses to send the multitudes away and now he's climbing up the mountain. Why didn't he choose to pray at the foot of the mountain? Why did he have to climb the mountain? Because maybe he knew that there was an encounter waiting for him at the top. And he had to, he had to go through the process to prepare himself for that encounter at the top of the mountain. Because with every step he was climbing up the mountain, he was having a, dip, a different perspective. But before he could get to the top, you know what he had to do? He had to get rid of the multitudes. Do you know why many times you find prayer difficult? It's because you haven't got rid of the multitudes. You're trying to go deep in God. You're trying to worry and worship at the same time. You have to first learn how to cast your cares and learn how to disconnect from the busyness and disconnect from the distractions before you're able to actually go deeper, before you're able to actually go higher, before you're able to see from a new perspective. There has to be a disconnection if there's going to be any elevation into the next dimension. So Jesus had to send away the multitudes. And I'm telling you, this is not easy to do. Because for many people, your prayer life is often just with the multitudes. You might have spent 30 minutes praying, and all you've done is you're just with the multitudes. Oh yeah, Lord, this. Oh yeah, Lord, this. Oh yeah, Lord, this. Oh yes, Lord. Amen. And you're out. So you've not actually got in space to encounter. You've not actually climbed up the mountain yet. You're still dealing with multitudes of distractions does anybody want to encounter with God here those who actually encounter God for real I don't mean those who just feel goosebumps I mean those who encounter God get to a place of oneness so we can be you see you can be physically here but you are not actually here so your body can be here while your mind is on sky news your body can be here while your mind is on food in the fridge whatever it is you can be here, but you're not here. So in the same way, when we come together, he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. He says, now we can translate that in another way and say, when you are gathered together in yourself in one, there is a manifestation of God there. In other words, when you decide you want to pray, and your body aligns with your soul, aligns with your spirit, and there's a oneness in you, which means really the distractions are cut off. In my experience, those are often the most powerful, effective times of prayer. Where I can zoom in to the presence of God, disconnect from the anxiety, the worries, and the cares, and focus on Him in a way where my heart is fixed. That's often such a powerful place in terms of the presence of God, in terms of the voice of God, in terms of perspective. Jesus climbed to the top of the mountain and he wasn't there for just one or two hours. He was probably there for, I would say, probably at least six hours. Because when he came off the top of the mountain, he started walking on water. And, you know, he sent his disciples away. They had been struggling in the same water for hours. While they were struggling, he was on the, he was on the mountaintop encountering God and praying. So he encounters God on the mountaintop. On that mountaintop, he has a whole new perspective of whatever he was feeling at that moment. Maybe dealing with the grief of John the Baptist. In this, in this context, dealing with coronavirus. <laughs> he had a whole new perspective. And he encountered God for hours at the top, and then he comes walking down. Now, because he's coming from the presence of God, something supernatural is going on. He starts to walk on water. 
the same water that the disciples are struggling in, he is walking on. This is what happens when you come from a place of encounter. You don't just listen to the news and you're just living by what is being said out there. Because you're coming from a place of encounter, what others are drowning in, guess what? <laughs> you're walking on top of it. Does anybody want to walk on top of what others are drowning in in this season? I'm telling you, as the church, you're called to walk on top of the fear. You're called to walk on top of the pan pandemic or whatever it's called. You're called to walk on top of whatever is being released in the culture right now. You're supposed to be on top of it, not under it. Aren't you seated in heavenly places? <laughs> if we are truly seated in heavenly places, that means the enemy is under our feet, right? So anything under your feet has no business dominating your head. So if, if it's dominating your head, there needs to be a shift of perspective. You need to climb up that mountain. The process of climbing up the mountain is not often easy. Because this is the struggle many people experience in the place of prayer. And I round up here. It's that you start to press in to seek God. And the first thing you face is the limitations of the flesh. The first things you encounter are the distractions or sometimes even the issues of the flesh. You are just climbing up the mountain. But many people don't learn how to push through those limitations. So the experience of prayer is just dealing with flesh issues but not getting to spiritual encounters. So they think prayer is boring. Can I just say to you, prayer is not boring. You are boring. Now, I find prayer boring sometimes, but I know it's not, that the, it's not that going through the motion in terms of spending time with God is boring. I know it's something to do with my flesh. It's not to do with the Holy Spirit. It's what's going on in here. And the sooner I learn to let go of those things and push past the pain and the distractions and let the Lord deal with the flesh issues... The sooner I'm able to get past that, the more I'm able to enjoy prayer. Have you ever spent time praying for five minutes and you feel like it's been two hours? And have you ever spent time praying for two hours and you felt like it's been five minutes? It's because of where you're, in, it's because of your, where you're praying from. You're not at the bottom. You're, at, you're praying from the top of the mountain now. Your heart is engaging. So in that time, in, when your heart is truly engaging and you're not worrying, but you're worshiping, and you're engaging in prayer, time goes like that. Because in that realm, it's like you're in, a, you're in an eternal realm. Because you're in God's realm. So you're more God conscious than flesh conscious. That's why time flies quickly. So when you're struggling with the time, just be aware. You have to climb up. Everyone say climb up. Climb. Now, back to where we started, the incense. We have to be believers that live from the top down. Not from down up, if that makes any sense. I'll touch on this more in the second service, so I'll just pause there. We have to be a be believers that live from heaven's perspective and looking down at earth. Not taking the lens of earth to observe heaven. Are you hearing me? And if we're going to hold that incense and be effective with the incense, then we need to first and foremost be able to push past the multitudes, push back our fleshly distractions, step into a place of encounter with God, where we're more God conscious than society and whatever else conscious. From that place, we release our incense. I believe that's the kind of incense that will stop the plague. Not the, incense that's, not the incense that's coming from fear. There's a difference between praying from a place of fear and praying from a place of faith. Because they're both prayers. Quick example. I now said I was going to round up, but this is it now. I'm going to round up here. The disciples are in the storm, right? This is a different storm. Not the one we just talked about. Not Matthew 14. They're in a storm and they feel like they're going to die. And the water is getting into the boat and they're drowning. 
Okay, so Jesus is asleep in the boat. They wake him up. He rebukes the wind, speaks peace to the sea, and everything goes calm. So he rebukes everything, and then you know what he does? He turns around and rebukes his disciples about their faith. Okay, let's just break down what the disciples did. They were scared, and so they ran to Jesus. What is that? That's prayer. Because they said to Jesus, Jesus, we need you. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying, Jesus, I need you. I pray all the time. Jesus, I need you. There's nothing wrong with that. Why did Jesus rebuke the disciples? Well, I don't know the reasons, but I think one of the reasons is probably because he expected them to be able to deal with the storm. Because of all the discipline and all the things he taught them. And plus, he said to them, let's go over to the other side. So here's where I'm landing. Why couldn't the disciples deal with the storm? Because the storm had got into them. Why could Jesus deal with the storm? Because peace was in him. He was asleep. And so he released peace to the storm. So the disciples were praying from a place of fear. Jesus came from a place of peace. So it's not just about the prayer. It's more about where the prayer is coming from. The prayer that's going to stop this plague has to come from the top of the mountain, which is the place of peace, the place of encounter. And I believe the church is called to be a prophetic voice at this hour to the nation and the nation.